Chess is one of the oldest and most recognized games in the world. It is an exciting game of strategy and planning, which is why it is seen as a symbol of intelligence. However, chess is easy to learn and can be enjoyed by anyone at any level. Chess is played on an 8x8 board with 64 squares and 32 pieces, and the game is all about checkmating the king. Once the king is in checkmate, which we'll explain later, then the game is over. So to start, let's meet the king. Even though the king is the most important piece in chess, it isn't the most powerful. The king can only move one square at a time in any direction. Here are the squares where the white king can currently move. Here's one move. Now the king could move here. And here's another king move. In chess, both players have identical sets of pieces. You have a king, and so does your opponent. Each player will take turns making a move until the game is over. Now that you've learned how the king moves, it's your turn to practice moving the king. Chess is one of the oldest and most recognized games in the world. The king might be the most important piece in chess, but the queen is by far the most powerful. Like the king, the queen can move in any direction, forward, backward, to the sides, as well as diagonally. Unlike the king, the queen can move as far as she wants in any direction. The one thing the queen can't do is jump over other pieces. Let's look at some queen moves. In this position, the queen could go all the way up the diagonal. She could slide all the way across the board. She could now move all the way down here, or she could make some shorter moves, like here, here, and here's another queen move. Earlier, we mentioned that the queen cannot jump over other pieces. In this position, let's say the queen wants to get to this square. Notice that the king is currently in the way of the queen, so the queen would have to move to another square first, and only then, on the next turn, could the queen move here. Now that you've learned how the queen moves, it's your turn to practice moving the queen.
After the queen, the rook is the second most powerful piece. It can move up, down, and to the sides as far as it wants, but the rook can only move in straight lines. Like the other pieces we've looked at so far, the rook also can't jump over any other piece. Let's take a look at some rook moves. In this position, the rook could move straight up, it could slide to the corner, it could move all the way down the board, now it could swing to the other side, or it could make some shorter moves, like here and here. Now that you've learned how the rook moves, it's your turn to practice moving the rook. The bishop is one of the most interesting pieces in chess because it can move as far as it wants, but only on diagonals. The bishop, just like the other pieces that we've met so far, cannot jump over other pieces. This means that the bishop has to stay on the same colored square it starts the game on for the entire game. In chess, you get two bishops. This bishop is called the light squared bishop because it can only travel on the light squares. Meet the other bishop that you have in the game, the dark squared bishop. It moves exactly like the light squared bishop, but only on the dark squared diagonals. Now that you've met both bishops, let's take a look at how they move. With just one move, the dark squared bishop can enter the longest dark squared diagonal on the board. Let's do the same with the light squared bishop. Now, notice no matter how many bishop moves we make, the bishops never cross paths. They never block each other. And the reason why is because they're on opposite colored squares, so they never interfere with each other. They make a good team. Now that you've learned how the bishops move, it's your turn to practice moving the bishops.
The knight is perhaps the most fun piece in chess. It is the only piece in chess that does not move in some sort of straight line. It moves in a strange L shape. The other interesting thing about the knight is it's the only piece in chess that can jump over other pieces, like this. It takes a little practice to understand exactly how the knight moves. It goes two squares in one direction and then one square to the side, like this. Highlighted are all the possible squares the knight can move to on the next turn. Notice it always moves in the same pattern. Two to the side and over one, like this, or like this, up two and over one, or down two and over one. And notice that the knight moves from a light square to a dark square, and then on the next turn it moves from a dark square to a light square. The knight always switches colors with each turn it makes. Now that you've learned how the knight moves, it's your turn to practice moving this fun and tricky piece. The pawn sounds like it is the humblest of chess pieces, but it is really one of the most powerful. When working together, pawns are the soul of chess. Pawns have a few strange rules, so make sure to pay attention. Pawns can only move straight forward, and they can only move one square at a time. However, if it is their first move of the game, they can choose to move two squares forward if there is nobody blocking them, as pawns cannot jump over other pieces. Remember, the pawn can choose to advance one or two squares only on the first move. On all other moves, the pawn advances one square. Pawns are also the only piece in chess that cannot move backwards. One other thing that makes them strange is that while they cannot move straight forward, pawns can only capture diagonally, and they can only capture one square away diagonally even if it is their first turn. We will explain capturing in one of the next lessons. Let's see some pawn moves. In this position, since this pawn has yet to move in the game, white decides to move it two squares forward. Black, on the other hand, only advances this pawn one square. Remember, even though you can move your pawn two squares on its first move, you're not forced to do so. White now advances the pawn forward, and now both pawns are blocked and cannot move. In this position, how many white pawns can move? If you said one, you're correct. Notice that this pawn is blocked by the black pawn directly in front of it. Remember, pawns cannot move backwards. White now has the option to move this pawn up one square. Notice this pawn cannot move two squares forward because the black pawn blocks it. Now it's your turn to practice using the pawns.
Remember, your pawns are the only pieces that cannot move backwards, so what happens when they reach the other side of the board? They get a promotion. You must trade your pawn for another piece. It can be a knight, a bishop, a rook, or the powerful queen. It cannot stay a pawn, and it cannot become a king. Also, it does not have to be one of the pieces already captured in the game. Every pawn has the potential to be promoted into a queen. You could trade it for another queen and have two queens on the board, which is incredibly powerful. Now, let's practice promoting some pawns. Now that you know how the chess pieces move, it's time to set up the game. Before you put the pieces on, make sure you turn the chessboard so that there's a light square in the bottom right corner. You can remember this as white on the right. The easiest way to start placing the pieces is to place all of the pawns on the second rank for each side. In chess, rank is the word for row. Let's put all of the white pawns on one side of the board and all of the black pawns on the other side. Now let's put the rooks out in the corners. Let's follow that up by putting the knights next to the rooks. We'll soon learn that the knights are placed on the B and G files. In chess, file is the word for column. To continue, let's put the bishops next to the knights. And now we're left with the king and the queen. Does it matter where they go? Yes, it does. The queen always goes on the matching square. The white queen goes on the light square, and the black queen goes on the dark square. Notice they should be lined up together. Finally, put the kings on the last empty squares. Now you're ready to play. In chess, each side takes only one turn at a time, and by tradition, white always moves first. Now that the board is set up, it's your turn to practice making moves for both sides. In order to get better at chess, you will need to learn notation, which is often referred to as the language of chess. Every square on the chessboard has a name, which is actually just its coordinates. As we mentioned before, each column is called a file, and each row is called a rank. 
Every file in chess is given a letter, starting with the letter A on the left side of the board and going all the way to the letter H on the right. Every rank is given a number, starting with 1 on the white side of the board and going up to the number 8 on the black side of the board. Each square is named by its coordinate pair. Let's meet some of the squares. This square in the lower left-hand corner is known as A1. Notice we identify it with the letter first and the number second. Let's take a look and see where the E file meets with the fourth rank. Notice the arrows point at E4, so this square is known as E4. Let's draw a diagonal starting from A1 and go all the way up the board. Notice we land on the H8 square, and in between these squares we see B2, C3, D4, E5, F6, and G7. Together, this is known as the A1 to H8 diagonal because the diagonal begins on A1 and ends on H8. Now that you've learned how to label each square on the chessboard, it's time to learn the notation of actual chess moves. Each piece has its own letter for chess notation. In this example, the king's letter is a capital K. With white to move, let's say the king is going to move to the E2 square. The way we describe that move is by saying the piece's letter first, which is capital K, then the square it moves to, E2. Remember, a piece always begins with a capital letter, and the square is always lowercase. So after the move, king E2, putting it all together, we say K E2. Let's say black wants to play king to D7. In this case, it's the same idea capital K, lowercase d7. So piece, then square, K, d7. We will use the same idea for all the other pieces. The rook is a capital R, the queen, a capital Q, the bishop, a capital B. The knight, however, is a little bit different. Since the capital K is already used for the king, we use a capital N for the knight. For example, N E6. Finally, you may think that pawns are a capital P. In this case, pawns are only written as the square that they move to. For example, after the move E4, the notation is simply the square the pawn moved to, E4. Now that you've learned the language of chess, it's your turn to practice using chess notation. You've already learned how to move the pieces, and we've mentioned the idea of capturing. Let's talk more about capturing. In chess, when you capture a piece, you simply move your own piece to the same square as your opponent's piece and replace their piece with your own. The captured piece is then removed from the board. You don't stop before the captured piece, you replace it entirely. Let's watch this queen capture a pawn. Now let's watch this knight jump over one of its own pieces to capture the queen. Capturing pieces is a critical part of the game. However, you do not have to capture a piece if you don't want to. 
That being said, if you can capture more of your opponent's pieces than they capture of yours, it's going to be much easier to win. One question about capturing that we haven't answered is, how do you notate a capture? Let's say in this position that you plan on taking the black queen with your queen on b3. A good idea. You would write the piece that will capture it, in this case, the queen. So we use a capital Q. You then write an X, which means captures. And then you write the square where the piece gets captured. So after queen takes e6, we would write Q, X, e6. Here is one more capturing question. How do we notate a pawn capturing a rook and promoting to a queen at the same time? Does it sound complicated? Don't worry, it's just one extra step. We start by notating the capture. Remember, we mark a pawn with the file that it is currently on. In this case, the pawn is on the B file. So we would write a lowercase b, then we would write captures, which is an x, so lowercase b, x, and then the square that we capture, a8, so bx a8. So far, we have bx a8. Since we are promoting to a queen, you simply add to the end of your move an equal sign, and then write which piece you are promoting the pawn into, which is usually the queen. So putting it all together, we would write b takes a8 equals queen. Now it's your turn to practice capturing pieces. Check is the word that is used when one piece is threatening to capture the other side's king. Check basically means look out, king in danger. Let's take a look at some examples of playing check. In this position, can you see how white can threaten to capture the black king? That's right, bishop to f6 check. White's bishop puts the black king in danger of capture, so black must deal with this check. In the next lesson, we'll learn about the three ways of getting out of check. In this position, black's rook can put white's king into danger. After rook d1, the white king is in check and white must respond to this attack. Finally, in this position, black's pawn is ready to capture the white knight. Remember, pawns capture one square away diagonally. Can you see how white can escape the pawn's attack and place the black king into check? If you found knight to g6, great job. The knight escapes danger and now puts the black king into check. One final question is how do we notate a check? It is pretty easy. All you do is add a plus to the end of your typical move notation. This means after writing ng6, you add a plus at the end. So it'll look like this, ng6 plus, 
meaning that black is in check. Now it's your turn to practice playing check. As we learned in the last lesson, when the king is in check, it must get out of check. You cannot ignore check and do another move you want to do while leaving your king in check. You have to stop the check. Luckily, you have three easy ways to get out of check. The simplest way to get out of check is to move your king to a square where it is no longer in check. Like this. Another way to get out of check is to block the check with another one of your pieces. Oftentimes, the best way to get out of check is to capture the checking piece. Now let's see you escape check. If a king is in check, and it cannot escape check by moving, blocking, or capturing, then the king is said to be in checkmate. That means you win. Or maybe your opponent won. Again, checkmate is the entire goal of chess. It doesn't matter who has captured the most pieces, or how long it has taken, or anything else. If the king is in checkmate, it's game over. Once the king is in checkmate, you don't have to take the king off the board, it's time to shake hands and say, good game. Now it's your turn to checkmate.
Chess can often be a long game with more than 100 moves played, but it can also be incredibly short if you want it to be. Many people want to know, what are the fastest checkmates? And we are going to show you, but keep in mind, none of these checkmates can be forced. These are only checkmates that you literally have to try to do on purpose because they can be otherwise defended very easily. Let's see the shortest possible checkmate on the board. White plays f3, not a great opening move, already exposing the king on the e1 to h4 diagonal. Black opens with e5. Notice the black queen is already looking at the weakened h4 square, ready to pay the white king a visit. White plays g4, further weakening the e1 to h4 diagonal, and the black queen pounces on the h4 square, delivering the fastest checkmate in chess. Notice that the white king cannot move, there's no way to block the check, and you can't capture the checking piece, so after two moves, the game is already over. In fact, it's time to start a new game. Let's see that idea again, but this time it'll be white delivering the checkmate. After e4, black plays f6, d4, g5. And can you spot the checkmate? That's right, queen h5, the fastest checkmate for white is in three moves, and the fastest checkmate for black is in just two moves. Let's hope that you never find yourself on the wrong side of this checkmate. Now it's your turn to practice the fastest checkmates. There is another kind of mate on the board called stalemate. Stalemate is what happens when your king is not in check, but you also have no other legal move on the board. And when this happens, it's a draw and nobody wins. You might be absolutely winning your game and about to checkmate the opponent's king, but if you fall into stalemate, it's a draw. This is best explained with some examples. In this position, with white to move, the game would be a stalemate, because white's only piece, the king, does not have any legal squares to move to, and white is not in check. In this position, let's say white plays queen to c2. The queen gets one square closer to the king, but notice black's king is not in check, and black does not have a legal move in this position. The position is a stalemate. Remember, in chess, you're never forced to make an illegal move, so black cannot put the king onto a square where it would be captured. In this position, can you find a better move for white? White can actually win the game in just one move after queen b2 checkmate. Remember, your opponent can never be in stalemate if they are in check. In this position, black looks doomed. The king is trapped in the corner, white is ready to deliver checkmate on the next move, and black is down lots of material. However, chess is a game of many opportunities. Even when things look really bad, you might still have a chance to save the game or at least draw. Notice that since black's king does not have any legal moves, if black's queen disappeared from the board, 
it would be a stalemate if it were black to move. In this position, can you find a way to make black's queen disappear and create a stalemate? If you found queen to h2 check, great job. White must deal with the check, and the only way to get out of the check is to capture the black queen. Now the only remaining piece is the black king, and since black's king does not have any legal squares, and black is not in check, the game is a stalemate. What a save by black. Let's take a look at this position. If white played the move queen to c7, it's not a very wise move because white, first of all, could have won the game immediately with queen to b7 checkmate, but also queen to c7 traps black's king. But does that mean it's a stalemate? Not in this position because notice black has another piece. Black could play the move h3, allowing white to correct the mistake from the last move and deliver checkmate with queen to b7. Notice if we added another pawn, just this pawn on h3, the position would now be a stalemate with black to move. Now that you've learned about stalemate, remember to stay alert and avoid it when you're winning, and when you're losing, keep your eyes open for the opportunity to save the game with stalemate. Stalemate is just one of the possible ways to end the game in a tie. Another way is to simply agree to a draw. This might happen if neither player can see a way to victory. One person offers the draw, and the other can accept or decline. Another way to get a draw is if the exact same position is repeated three times. After three repetitions, either player can claim a draw when it is their turn to move. Or, if you're playing online, 
a draw will automatically be called after five repetitions. Another way to draw is if neither player has enough pieces to checkmate, like lone king versus lone king. You'll learn more about this later. Finally, you can also draw if 50 pairs of moves have been played on the board without any captures or pawn moves. This keeps you from dying of boredom as you and your opponent move your rooks back and forth forever. Now it's your turn to practice drawn positions. One of the most unusual rules of chess is called castling. This move was invented to speed up the game and do two things at once. When you castle, your king moves toward the safety of the corner and your rook comes toward the action in the middle. You literally are moving two pieces at once, but it counts as just one move. You can castle in either direction, left or right. In either case, your king moves over only two squares and then the rook from that side is moved directly to the other side of the king like this. And here's another example of castling. Castling is a great move with many benefits if it is used at the right time. However, there are a few conditions that may prevent you from castling. First off, you cannot castle when you are in check. You must first deal with the check before trying to castle. Secondly, you cannot castle if your king would castle through a check or after castling, your king would land into a check. Next, you cannot castle if there are any pieces in between your king and your rook. It must be completely empty. In this position, both white and black have to move one piece before they're able to castle. After knight f3 and bishop c5, for example, both sides are now able to castle kingside. Finally, you cannot castle if your king has made any other move before or if the rook you are castling with has already moved it must be the first move for both pieces. In this position, the only legal castling move is for black. Since white's king has already moved, white cannot castle. 
Notice Black can only castle with the rook on h8 because the other rook has already moved. What is the notation for castling? It depends on if you castle kingside or queenside. In this position, let's say white castles kingside. The way you would write it is 0 dash 0. If black now castles queenside, we would add one more 0. So it would be 0 dash 0 dash 0. One way that can help you remember this is notice on the king side there are two squares between the white king and the rook. Notice 0 dash 0 has two zeros. So king side castling, two squares, two zeros. Notice on the queen side there's three squares between the king and the rook. Queen side castling has three zeros, 0 dash 0 dash 0. Now it's your turn to castle. The last weird rule in chess is called en passant, which is French for in passing. This rule was introduced at the same time that pawns were allowed to move forward two squares on their first move. When that happened, sometimes pawns would move past other pawns without giving the other pawn an opportunity to capture, which didn't seem fair. So en passant was invented. Pay attention, it's tricky. If your opponent's pawn moves forward two squares, which it can only do if it is that pawn's first move, and it lands directly next to one of your pawns, then on your next turn, and that turn only, you have the opportunity to capture that pawn as if it had only moved one square, like this. Let's take a look at that again. If a pawn is moved forward two squares and lands next to another pawn, that pawn can capture the first pawn on its very next move. You move behind the pawn as if it had moved only one square and capture it, placing it off the board. You might get some weird looks if you do this move in a game with someone who doesn't know, but it's an important rule of chess. Now that you've learned en passant, let's have you try it.
Now that you've learned how to move, to capture, to check, and checkmate, as well as do the special moves in chess like castling and en passant, it's time for you to feel what it's like in a real game. In a real game, nobody is there to tell you what to move. You have to think and decide, what is the right move? Should I move a piece, or can I capture something? Should I castle, or try to promote one of my pawns? This is where the thinking part of chess comes in, and you have to try and decide what your best move is. The only way to do this is by looking at the board and considering both your options and your opponent's possible plans, and then trying to decide which move improves your position the most. Sometimes the right move will jump right out at you. Rook h8, checkmate. At other times, you'll have absolutely no idea what the best move is. Let's see if you can find a good move in each of the following positions. Black is currently up three pawns, so Black decides to offer a trade of queens, thinking it will be easier to win the game without having to deal with White's queen. Black didn't consider what the queen was doing on the eighth rank. Can you find White's best move? The Black Queen gave up protection of the back rank and forgot to ask what checks White has in the position. White only has one check, but it's checkmate. If you found Queen E8 checkmate, great job. This checkmate is known as a back rank checkmate. In this position, after Rook A1 check, it looks like Black is about to deliver a back rank checkmate. What is White to do? Well, if White decides to block with Rook E1, Notice that doesn't help because after rook takes e1, it's checkmate. Let's look a little closer. Can you find another white piece that can help us deal with the check? If you found the move bishop takes a1, great job. The bishop moves all the way from the other side of the board to come to the rescue, capturing the checking piece. Remember, if you can capture a checking piece, this can often be the best way to get out of check. In this position, what do you think is White's best move? If you're thinking Rook A8 delivering a back rank checkmate, you have to remember it's not just your moves you have to consider, we also have to figure out what is our opponent doing. In this position, White's best move is also White's only move because notice, White is in check. And in this position, White must deal with the check first and play King H1. Now Black has to be careful and deal with white's threat on the next turn. In this position, can you find white's best move? Notice that we can capture a pawn with rook takes e4, but then black is able to do the same thing with knight takes a7. Remember, when you find a good move, always look for a better move. Don't forget about your pawn on a7. It's one move away from reaching the eighth rank. Do you remember what happens when a pawn reaches the other side of the board? That's right, the pawn gets a promotion. Notice the newly promoted queen puts the black king into check and threatens the knight all at the same time. After king f7, queen takes c6 wins the knight. It takes time and practice to find the best move. Now it's your turn to continue practicing finding the best move.
you know the rules and how to play. But now it's time to see the ideas you have learned put into action in an actual game. In this game, we'll see how two pieces working together can be a powerful force and that a king surrounded by pieces isn't always safe. Let's take a look. White begins the game with e4, controlling the center and opening up lines for the queen and light squared bishop. Black plays c6, a move we haven't seen yet. The idea is to prepare the move d5 on the next turn and attack the strong pawn on e4. White plays d4, controlling more space in the center and also opening up the dark squared bishop. Black strikes back in the center with d5, threatening to capture the pawn on e4 on the very next move. When the opponent threatens to take one of our pieces, it's natural to feel worried. Remember, it's okay to make even trades, such as a pawn for a pawn. What you don't want is to give away your pieces for nothing. In this situation, white could push the pawn forward with e5, white could capture the pawn on d5, or, as in the game, protect the pawn and develop a piece with knight to c3. After d takes e4, knight takes e4, white's knight recaptures the pawn and moves directly into the center. Black now plays knight to d7, developing a knight and also preparing the next move, knight g to f6, with the idea that if the knight gets captured, black is ready to recapture the knight, like that. The drawback to this move is the light squared bishop is blocked and also notice black's king has no moves. We'll take a look and see if that becomes a problem. White plays bishop to c4, activating the bishop to a powerful diagonal and as you know, pointing at the weakest point in black's camp, f7. Black plays knight g to f6, attacking white's knight, and white plays knight to g5, avoiding the knight's attack and joining the light squared bishop in attacking the f7 square. In this position, black should play e6, blocking the light squared bishop's path to the f7 square, but black does not have a sense of danger in the position and plays h6, attacking the knight and assuming that it's going to move backwards. Can you find the move that immediately wins the game for white? That's right, bishop takes f7. White delivers checkmate, threatening to capture the king on the next turn and notice black's king is surrounded, or should we say smothered, by its own pieces. It cannot escape the attack. You've learned a lot so far. Can you put your ideas into action? Let's prove it in the challenges.